believe that at this point, I, I need to introduce our guest to all, any of you. You come back regularly because of how much you enjoy and learn from her programs. It's a delight to welcome you all. We're very delighted to also welcome back Dale Sharon, who's going to begin a new series with us today on women and art. Dale, thank you as always for the time and trouble you take to make these presentations so amazing. Well, thank you, Stephen. It was really sweet. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. And um, thank you all again for joining us. Um, so happy to see you all again. And I hope you're all doing well. Um, once more, I'd like to thank the Mirawitz Center for the opportunity to present these programs to you. Um, today's topic is Women and Art is presented in the permanent collection of the St. Louis Art Museum. As, as I was putting this program together, I quickly realized that this is an endless discussion. As usual, there is so much to consider in scores of masterpieces in SLAM that help define this topic. So I've divided the tour into four parts. We'll be looking at women in art from two perspectives. First, part one and two will address the ways in which women were depicted in the visual arts over the centuries. How the woman was represented in painting, sculpture, and prints. And part three and four will look at women artists through the wide ranging in-depth collection at SLAM. You know, the history of art has not been kind to women. Um, look at the attitudes towards women emanating from some of the most celebrated male minds of Western culture. For example, um, Pythagoras in the sixth century BC said, there is a good principle which created order, light, and man, and an evil principle which created chaos, darkness, and women. Martin Luther in 1500 said, girls begin to talk and stand on their feet sooner than boys because weeds grow more quickly than good crops. Renmoor said, I consider women writers and politicians as monsters. The woman artist is merely ridiculous. And George Bazelot said, female artists can't paint. Notice how little these attitudes change from the 6th century BC to the 20th century. Remember, women didn't get the right to vote until 1920 in the United States. It's amazing then that any women at all became an artist, especially when you realized that until the 20th century, women were rarely allowed to attend art school, join artist guilds or academies. In fact, many were kept from learning to read or write. For most of history, women have been by law considered property of their fathers or husbands or brothers, who almost always believed that women were put on earth to bear children. And this attitude spilled over into the art. There was a segment on CBS Sunday morning, which I love to watch, um, which was pertaining to women in art that caught my attention. I don't know if any of you saw it, it was titled A Monumental Oversight and was about sculpture in America. They reported that there are 22 sculptures in Central Park in New York City. Guess how many were women? Right, none, but one was a dog. In the country, there are over 5,000 outdoor statues and only 400 are women. In the Capitol building, there are 100 statues and only nine are women. So from this perspective, women have been sorely underrepresented. And from the perspective of this cartoon, women over the centuries were not appreciated for their accomplishments, but instead for their domestic roles. My pun loving husband said that it was about time we put women on a pedestal. The truth is that there have been a wealth of depictions of women in art throughout Western history. And it's interesting to get a close look at the representation of women in art through the ages, because it informs us about the women's status in society. And like the cartoon, what women were valued for. Here's an interesting statistic. Less than 5% of the artists in most museums are women. 
but 85% of the nude figures in museums are female. Throughout history, a high value was placed on the expressed male experience. This actually has a name. It's called the male gaze, the many ways artists depicted women through history. Women could be the nurturing mother or the whore, the seductress or the, self, or the loving self-sacrificing wife, the Barbie doll or the virtuous saint, the heroine or the upper class noblewoman, the hard worker or the window dressing socialite. And all of these are in one way or another represented in Slam's collection. So let's look at a few images of women in their many guises and begin with a look at royalty and nobility in the court. There are many depictions of queens and noble women in our collection. These next pieces come from different centuries and cultures and are made of different styles, but all depict royalty or nobility, women with a sense of pride, dignity, honor, and position in society. This gorgeous mummy mask illustrates that Lady Kay was a very important lady in Egypt's golden age. Her name actually means twice beautiful. She warranted this incredible mask, which covered her mummified body. Now artistically, Egyptians were not interested in individualized spatial details, but depicted their citizens, whether male or female, in roles or jobs or their position in society. The fine carving and materials tell us that this lady was an ancient Egyptian noblewoman. The face is not a portrait of the deceased, but instead an idealized representation, complete with gold skin of the gods. In each hand, she holds a wooden amulet to signify strength and welfare. A delicate scene carved on relief on her arms show a successful ascent into the afterlife. This handsome mask has an extraordinary presence with its gilt face, and realistic wig. The band around her head is inlaid with glass, surprising because glass was as costly and rare as the turquoise and carnelian for which it was substituted. It, I, I wasn't exaggerating when I said that this mask was gorgeous. You will not believe how stunning it is, especially when you think that it's over 3,000 years old. The most important woman in Flavian period in ancient Rome was Emperor Domitian's wife, Domitia Longina. It's thought that Domitia was involved in the murder of her husband in 96 AD. They were not exactly your model couple. My husband said it was, quote, love at first gripe. The last three years of Domitian's reign were characterized by a vicious cycle caused by his fear of revolt and assassination which led to cruelty, tyranny, and executions. He had vestal virgins executed and buried alive, harassed and tortured philosophers and Jews. He executed officials who opposed his policies and confiscated their property. This in turn led to more plots and eventually to his death. As time passed, Domitian became increasingly suspicious of everyone and put to death anyone he believed to be disloyal. It's thought that Domitia may have found her name on a list of people suspected of disloyalty and so became part of the plot to assassinate her husband. The plot was carried out in 96 AD and Domitia lived on for several years while respected by the citizens of Rome. Domitia's personality manages to penetrate the smooth face peering out from the elaborate coiffure. She looks to be determined and strong and resolute these banana curls illustrate the characteristic hairstyle of the female elite. It was also a convenient place to hide small vials of poison. I mean, you never know when you might need some. We think ancient sculpture was just unpainted natural stone or bronze because that's really how we found them. However, sculptures such as this one would have been brightly painted with rouge and lipstick and tufts of her hair would have been inserted in the curls. Domitia was married to one of the most neurotic Roman emperors, and in this sculpture, one can see a will of iron drive and determination that must have helped her navigate through her, her dangerous world. 
We talk about this painting often, but is uniquely appropriate for one of the most in one of the most important in our collection. Sir Henry Guildford was a boyhood friend and controller of King Henry VIII. This splendid portrait of his wife Mary is among the most impressive of Hans Holbein's noble and dignified English paintings. Holbein even vetted the future brides for Henry VIII with his drawings. His portrait is one of a pair that presented a wealthy and important husband and wife. Mary is the second wife of Henry and much younger than he. His portrait on the right still lives in Windsor Castle. So this portrait had to show Lady Guildford in the best light. In this painting, Lady Guildford is so serious and formidable that it's almost like talking to St. Paul's Cathedral. But in reality, she was merely 23 years old and a winsome charmer at the time. And you can see that in Holbein's drawing on the right. Her demeanor and dress were meant to make her appear more mature and well-bred. Hung with gold chains and embellished with pearls, Lady Guildeford embodies worldly prosperity. And with her prayer book, she's also the very image of propriety. The background ivy may have been intended as an emblem of steadfastness and love. And the rosary represents faith and the classic column indicates a cultured woman. The Lady G in high fashion plucked the hair from her forehead to represent intelligence. It was believed that the larger the forehead, the smarter the woman. An old saying goes, no grass grows on a busy street. She was depicted as a re respectable, refined, accepted, and proper court wife. This painting is thought to be a representation of Camilla Martelli, mistress and then second wife of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Cosimo de' Medici I. So how would the wife, the head of the most powerful family in Florence be portrayed? Well, just like this. Camilla wears an unusual but exquisite ensemble that indicates the sitter was a woman of great wealth and importance. She wears an extravagant necklace with a large cut diamond and luxurious pearl. X-rays show that her hand was repainted and moved down to make room for the incredible necklace and pendant. After the death of Cosimo's first wife, Camilla became Cosimo's lover despite being 26 years his junior. Camilla stood by him during his old age when because of his poor health, he retired to private life. Camilla was the main focus of bitter arguments between Cosimo and his children. They didn't agree with her appetite for ostentatious luxury, which we can see in this painting. To them, she appeared vulgar in comparison to their tasteful, elegant um, late wife, their mother. And to top it off, she was spending their money. After Cosimo's death, Camilla was forced to retire to a Florentine convent. But there is no question that this elaborate portrait indicated a woman of high status and wealth. This terracotta bust was a study for a marble portrait, which is now lost, of Madame du Barry. She was the last and loveliest mistress of Louis XV. The sculpture presents a vulnerable young woman rather than the powerful individual she ultimately became. Lemoyne was the favorite court sculptor of the time. Unfortunately, much of his work was destroyed in the revolution. Madame du Barry was one of the most famous beauties of her day. The sculptor Lemoyne seemed to have captured her perfectly. Though King Louis allowed her to participate in state councils, Du Barry much preferred to spend her time on pretty dresses and examining bigger and bigger baubles and jewels. When Du Barry began her relationship with King Louis XV, he was an aging man, and his grandson Louis XVI was about to marry the most notorious woman in French history, Marie Antoinette. Antoinette and Du Barry met on the eve of the royal wedding, and it was hate at first sight. Marie Antoinette loathed Du Barry so much that for years, she point blank refused to speak to her for any reason. When Marie Antoinette became queen, she wasted no time banishing the king's mistress to a convent. For all of her joie de vivre, Madame de Berry met an utterly tragic end. In 1789, all Marie Antoinette and Madame de Berry's queenly infighting meant nothing. The French Revolution had begun. 
Both women spent the next four years trying to stay alive in a world that absolutely detested them. In 1793, the beautiful Madame de Berry went to her dark fate at the guillotine. We're obviously jumping ahead several centuries, but our contemporary world is just as obsessed with celebrity and royalty as past generations were. These two images are representations of a style called pop art. In the years following World War II, America enjoyed an unprecedented period of popular culture and increased consumerism. From this, a new generation of artists emerged. These artists made art that mirrored and at times incorporated everyday items, consumer goods and mass media, imagery along with heavy doses of irony and wit. Because of its intended popular appeal and its engagement with popular culture, it was obviously called pop art. Pop artists, including Andy Warhol and Gerhard Richter, sought to connect the traditions of fine art with the mass culture of television. I think that, um, oh my goodness, my, my screen is just blurring. Okay, here we go. Um, pop artists, including Andy Warhol and Richter, sought to connect the traditions of fine art with the mass culture of television, advertising, and here as we see celebrity. They adopted commercial advertising methods like silk screening and produced multiples like these two prints. Andy Warhol began using images of Jackie Kennedy after the assassination of JFK. He found a timeless and elegant subject in the former first lady who's portrayed as a paragon of strength and tragedy in American culture. Warhol celebrated the power of the icon. Fame and its agents intoxicated him, and he understood celebrity as integral to modern life. Was this different from the court of Henry VIII or the Medicis? All were the most famous in their time. Jackie was the perfect 20th century iconic image. Gerhard Richter is one of the foremost painters in post-war European art, alternating between figurative and abstract approaches, his work intentionally defies stylistic categorization. He moves from one style to another using many different and creative techniques. Photography was central to Richter's work. In 1962, he began making paintings directly after photographs found in newspapers or magazine publications. Richter reveled in reproducing, juxtaposing, and repeating everyday images from popular culture. These were images that anyone walking down the street would recognize in a split second. Celebrities, royalty, politicians. Richter's blurred image of Queen Elizabeth is a fine example. On the other side of the coin, throughout history, domestic life has been a fundamental source of inspiration for artists. Whether it be lavish interiors or simplistic homely acts, Artworks have repeatedly visualized domesticity as a worthy subject. Women were represented in the role of a good wife or mother, spending time with their family or tending to household chores. This next work proves home is where the art is. This painting is an image of a Dutch family reflecting the so-called golden age of Holland in the 17th century. Different color schemes allow the artist to capture the contrast between the two worlds coming together in the foyer of an upper-class Dutch home when beggars come to the door. As we see here in the 1660s, women became elegantly slender, a new ideal of beauty. The bold tile floor and the rich coloration of their clothing define the realm of the wealthy household, while the musicians' murky browns attest to their much less privileged lives. The action takes place in an entrance hall, typical for the artist. Jacob Octervelt credited with the development of the entrance hall painting. Here a young mother teaches her child to give alms to the industrious musicians. It's a sort of 17th century upstairs, downstairs kind of thing. In paintings such as these, we get a look into the life of 17th century upper class household. 
Franz Hals was one of the foremost portraitists of 17th century Holland, known for his depictions of Dutch upper-class citizens. This woman represents a demure and approachable personality, the very essence of the respected 17th century wife. Hals captured the details of this woman's clothing, which, although not flamboyant, shouts wealth. Black was the most expensive dye and probably came from the Spanish court or church. Cloth was itself expensive, and the voluminous dress therefore reflects luxury. And the lace cost about a year's salary for an average worker, all signs of her family's prosperity. In these paintings, you can see the spontaneity of Hall's work, the strong sense of personality of the sitter and his attention to details. You can even see the veins in her hands. These are painted during the height of his popularity and were painted without first doing a drawing or study. So the forms and textures were suggested rather than delineated, giving his work a lively, fresh quality. The unknown woman sat for the artist together with her husband, whose portrait on the right is now in the collection of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. And every so often, our two museums have a family reunion. Rembrandt was a master printmaker, perhaps the best of all time. His printmaking reflects his interest in innovation and experimentation. Rembrandt's legacy as an etcher is characterized by the new and innovative techniques he introduced to printmaking. Rembrandt added emotional and psychological depth to his subjects through expressive faces, body language, and his bold use of shadow and light. Rembrandt made close to 350 etchings during his lifetime, regularly reworked copper plates, adding new details, thus creating several unique versions or states of a given work. He was so imaginative and skillful that even scratches and accidents with the acid wash would be used to his advantage. His image of his mother is of a woman who is strong and determined and probably a disciplinarian. She looks modest, not prideful, but genuine and straightforward and reliable. I have a feeling that Rembrandt had kind feelings toward his mother after looking at this print, and yet was perhaps a bit afraid to disobey her. Rembrandt's work seemed to transcend time. His etchings are truly masterful, and the incredible details of line and shadow must be seen in person to be fully appreciated. This painting depicts a tender moment as a peasant mother teaches her daughter to knit. It's a realistic depiction of the dress and character of the peasant class. Even their fingernails are dirty. The girl is absorbed in her work on a sock using four needles and a ball of white yarn. The ability to make and mend clothing was an important skill for women within rural communities. Malay's painting was inspired by a study of his wife and one of his six daughters. This is a country mom preparing her daughter for life skills. It has a warmth and sweetness to it. The mother is patient and understanding. The daughter is concentrating, absorbing her task. It offers a simple look into French rural life and represents how women did work around the house and how daughters should learn and follow in their footsteps. It's about family time spent together. Women actually spent lots of time with their children and this painting portrays that well. Malay democratized art by focusing on everyday people, not royalty, not nobility. He's known for his dark palette and strong human sympathy. Artists that followed were drawn to his images of simplicity in the rural life of farmers and in the quiet domestic chores such as in our painting. These paintings are rather interesting because they're on opposite sides of the same canvas. For many years, the portrait of Marie, Cezanne's sister, was thought to be the portrait, the portrait of the canvas. But a hundred years later, it was discovered that underneath the black coating on the reverse was a portrait of Cezanne's mother, which are pretty few and far between. We don't know who blackened it out or even when, Cezanne's mother was the person who was always supportive of Paul. 
The portrait, therefore, is softer and more sympathetic than this picture of his sister, who, along with his father, were pretty dismissive of his talent as an artist all through his life. His father, the archetypical self-made man, wanted Paul to be a lawyer and made his son study for a couple of years after his schooling. Probably with the help of his wife, Cezanne's father eventually realized that he couldn't make his son be a good lawyer, and so provided him with a meager monthly allowance to enable him to study art. His father was the co-founder of a banking firm that prospered throughout his, the artist's life, affording Cezanne financial security that was unavailable to most of his contemporaries and he eventually resulted in a large inheritance. This portrait of the artist's sister Marie was largely painted in a kind of aggressive technique with a palette knife, resulting in thick strokes of color and a subtle, subtle impasto. Impasto is texture, it's lots of layers of paint. Cezanne's reliance on family as subject is underscored by the later more restrained and agreeable portrait of his mother. These paintings seem to explode beyond its limits in surface. But by the 1880s, his brushwork changed and became increasingly systematic and ordered. His geometric landscapes, still lives and bathers are the most well-known of Cezanne's works. Cezanne was often called the father of modern art. He pushed the boundaries of seeing, paving the way for further developments in, of abstraction in the 20th century. This watercolor is a superb example of the early work of the American Impressionist child Hassam. It's a portrait of his soon-to-be wife Maud sewing in bed. He creates a warm and intimate portrait of his future wife. Child Hassam, a pioneer American Impressionist, perhaps his most devoted, prolific, and successful practitioner, was trained as a draftsman at a wood engraving shop. He then began painting American scenes with the pastel palette and broken brushstrokes of the French Impressionists. Now, of all the American artists called Impressionists, Hassan was among those whose work most closely followed his French colleagues. This watercolor is charming and engaging, and the appealing portrait suggests the fondness Hassan was said to have had for his wife. Child Hassam continued to use Maud as a model throughout his career, and all are sweet and loving images. Hassam produced over 3,000 paintings, oils, watercolors, etchings, and lithographs over the course of his career. And with his wife by his side was an influential American artist of the 20th century. Last year, one of his paintings sold at auction for $42 million. Le Chase, the sculptor, wrote in 1928, quote, I met a young American woman who immediately became my inspiration. The young American in question, Isabel Nagel, would eventually become Le Chay's wife, and standing woman and other works are beautifully inspired by her. You are, he once said, the goddess I am searching for. Le Chase was devoted to his wife, modeling numerous sculptures of her, and even asking his patrons for extra money to buy her gifts. She was his 30-year inspiration. She was his muse, a modern Venus. And that was really how he depicted her. Like many 20th century sculptors, the Chays wanted to escape the classical tradition. And some of his works distend and exaggerate parts of the female body. She's an ample woman, not slender as was the taste of the time. Usually in history, it was seen as good and healthy to have curves showing fertility. His many sculptures of Isabel express deep, his deep, intense love and profound devo devotion to her. Horace Pippin was a self-taught African-American artist who began painting after he was wounded in World War I. In 1917, Pippin enlisted in the infantry in an all-Black unit that saw active duty in France. A sniper shot Pippin in the right shoulder, permanently disabling his arm. Shortly after his return to the States in 1919, he received an honorable discharge and a disability pension, married a laundress, and moved to Pennsylvania. 
Unable to perform manual labor, Pippin worked at odd jobs to supplement his pension and began to paint cigar boxes. He executed his first oil painting in 1928 and over the next decade produced only one to four paintings a year. Pippin's laborious painting process involved pop propping up his permanently injured right arm with a poker and guiding it with his left hand. Sunday morning breakfast is a scene remembered from his youth in New York. Entirely self-taught, he painted in a non-academic linear style that was characterized by a powerful sense of design and expressive use of color. His works are decorative and highly stylized. He painted a wide range of subjects, including scenes like this family at breakfast. A kettle whistles on a glowing stove as two children eagerly await their breakfast in this warm family scene. Here the mother wearing an apron is a central figure making sure that her family is fed. Now we turn to women as sexy and sensual and alluring. Figures with no clothes are particularly common in the art of the Western world. Nude figures as old as art itself appear in art in most cultures. In this section, I want to show you a variety of female nudes and alluring figures from religious icons to goddesses to courtesans to 20th century stylized images. Physical beauty is an ever morphing construct. Female nudes tend to conform to the ideal beauty of their time. My husband calls the study of nudes bearing it all. Hmm. With the arrival of Christianity, nakedness all but disappeared from Western art, except for depictions of Adam and Eve, whose nakedness revealed their sin, and Jesus, whose naked body revealed his wounds. Their bodies were exposed for theological reasons. Bare-breasted nursing Madonnas and naked baby Jesuses were the exceptions. And then came the Renaissance. By the Renaissance, nudity had idealized proportions based on mathematical ratios, and nude images were everywhere, everywhere, male and female. This engraving of Adam and Eve from the late Northern European Renaissance by Albrecht Durer shows an extensive knowledge of anatomy, but in a way that is highly unrealistic. Eve isn't portrayed as a woman as much as a smaller version of a man with breasts and long hair. It also manifests Durer's fascination with ideal form. The figures are nearly in symmetrical poses, and that of Adam is reminiscent of a Greek god. The engraving is meant to show Adam and Eve as physically perfect. For Durer, who mostly depicted Christian subjects, the creation of theoretically perfect human bodies was a pathway to comprehending the divine. He thus represented Adam and Eve as he understood them in both theological and artistic terms. Moments before tasting the forbidden fruit, they are still uncorrupted, existing in a state of faultless beauty. In the creation of this iconic tableau, the fig leaf becomes the symbol of chastity and modesty used to protect and shield the reputations of mere mortals. The intersection of commerce with the seamy side of love inspired the secular Durer engraving on the right, ill-suited couple. The title refers to the difference in age between the two would-be lovers. In this popular Renaissance genre, lecherous old men attempt to grope beautiful courtesans who hold out for more money or steal the rest of their conquest belongings. Love is on offer to the highest bidder in a mercenary transaction that's anything but courtly. It's one of Durer's, what he calls moralizing prints that were extremely popular with the masses. Albert Durer is wildly hailed as one of the greatest German artists. He came from a family of artists and was an accomplished printmaker, draftsman, painter, and theorist of the Renaissance age. He became a leader of the Northern Renaissance, incorporating a new scientific approach to perspective and human anatomy. He served as an official court artist to two Holy Roman emperors and created portraits for luminaries. Humorously, 
he had three assistants, all of whom were named Hans. Durer is perhaps best known for revolutionizing the field of printmaking, elevating the medium to an independent art form. Prints could now sit side by side with paintings. During the Renaissance, rendering the human figure expressed profound admiration for the body as the shape of humanity. Yet Renaissance artists do not celebrate human variety. These news are conceptually idealized, the perfected ideal person. Each one had a vision of health, youth, and geometric clarity. Idealization, that is the hallmark. The art of this time revived the artistic principles of the classic world. This particular nude does not necessarily reflect the study of an actual woman. Figures of this type are almost always symbolic. This woman probably represents the concept of fortune or chance. And the two shields may refer to a wedding. And this panel formed part of a window for a secular building. Because portrayals of nude women were reflective of artistic talent, it helps to explain the proliferation of female nudity within Renaissance art. And nudity was a popular feature of mythological and allegorical paintings, such as this one. This painting depicts a version of the ancient myth popularized in 16th century Italy, in which Perseus arrives and strides Pegasus to save the beautiful Andromeda. Small mythological scenes like this, which are painted on stone, amazingly, made Darpino one of Rome's most fashionable painters among sophisticated connoisseurs. So here is the story. Ravishing and irresistible, Andromeda was sacrificed to the sea monster Cetus as a means of appeasing an angry, vengeful Poseidon, god of the sea. Thus it was that our hero Perseus found himself face to face with the beautiful Andromeda, chained helplessly onto the rocks awaiting her doom. Perseus immediately fell in love with the lovely maiden and promptly killed Cetus the beast who'd been licking his lips at the prospect of having a delicious meal. They eventually married and Perseus and his wife Andromeda lived happily ever after. Not very usual in Greek mythology. One of the most famous descendants of Perseus was another Greek hero, Heracles. So a story with a hero and a beautiful nude alluring maiden and a happy ending. Stories in Greek mythology are generally first rate soap operas, many times with the female nude front and center, and this is no exception. In the myth presented here, Cephalus is an expert hunter who's married to a pretty lady named Procris. These two are super in love and everything is great until there's always an until in Greek mythology. Cephalus loved to hunt and had been given gifts from the gods, a javelin that always hits its mark and a dog that could outrun any other animal. Cephalus and Procris's marriage gets rocky when some gossip tells Procris that Cephalus is cheating on her. The busybody hears Cephalus, who's hot from hunting, singing in a breeze, asking the breeze to come and cool him off. The gossip thinks that Cephalus is flirting with another woman. Procris decides to go and spy on her husband while he's hunting. Cephalus hears something rustling in the bush and hurls his super accurate spear. It's really too bad that the spear never misses its mark since in this case, it's Procris hiding behind the bushes. She dies in his arms. Like many of his contemporaries, Widowall used contrived poses, exaggerated proportions, and sulfuric acidic colors to tell the story. This style is called mannerism, popular for only a very short period of time. So here we have a sad and tragic story that is so commonplace in mythology. Okay, so she's not nude, but she is alluring and provocative and she is a courtesan. At first glance, this image appears to be a simple picture of a smiling young girl. 
It is in fact a prostitute's portrait. The provocative dress gives us a hint as to her profession. No respected woman of that time would be shown with her chemise underwear showing. The sleeves and vests are loosely tied, inviting behavior to untie. Because fabric was so expensive, changing the sleeves or vests made the dress look new. Most women wore veils to cover their hair. She borrowed a man's hat, which is also flirting and inviting. And the dress is colorful, low cut and suggestive, not the dark up to the net proper fabric of Dutch women of the time. Um, we saw that in the, in the house portrait a few, a few slides ago. She was simply advertising her ability, her availability in brothels. Think Mae West, come up and see me sometime. The medallion inscription that she's holding uh, says, who can tell my backside from my behind? And it confirms the erotic nature of this image. She looks directly at the viewer and smiles coyly, beckoning the viewer into the space. It was unusual for women, yet, yet alone a prostitute, to stare at someone so bluntly. Rich coloration, brilliant highlights and darkened shadows, all are the hallmarks of Van Hasselhoff's style. She is naughty, but with clothes on. And I love the smile. Hogarth was a trained engraver, best known for his serious paintings of modern moral subjects. He sold engravings of these paintings on subscription, which were very popular at the time. They were sometimes presented as three or even six captioned images on one page, creating a sequential visual narrative that was a forerunner of comics. A Harlot's Progress was released after a crackdown on prostitution in London was underway. Prostitutes working in brothels and on the streets tended to be characterized as vain, artful temptresses who were directly responsible for the moral corruption and spread of disease in the city. But by the 1730s, the emphasis on blame and revulsion was partly tempered by a convention that presented the prostitute as an innocent country girl who arrives in the city alone and vulnerable and is tricked into prostitution by a devious brothel keeper. Hogarth incorporated these inconsistent representations into a harlot's progress. The series charged the, un the unfortunate fall of a pretty young ingenue to, to prostitute after her arrival in London, in London. Things go from bad to worse with her untimely death. A harlot's progress is about the cycle of innocence, corrupted, sex, decay, and death. Not least of all, it's a tale of the vulnerable position of women in a society whose laws, customs, and members were predisposed against them. Fast forward to the 19th century, and the nude had now become a unique facet of art, unbound by its previous overly symbolic connections to ancient history and mythology. This was the beginning of nudity, being seen as a tool for expression rather than as an object of perception. This woman too is a courtesan and her voluptuous depiction is seductive and arresting. She almost appears to be glowing and her position in the lighting contributes to the, the sensuality, I think, of the composition. She also looks at the viewer directly, exuding confidence about her body. Nana is a Parisian prostitute from Emile Nola's novel, Nana, written in 1880. Korn's paintings were primarily based on literary or allegorical themes, frequently using the nude. He became known for his extraordinary central rotund renderings of the female body. Buxom sensuality corresponds to Nana as a physical type. She is the very personification of carnality. Zola completed Nana in 1880, the ninth book in a series that was meant to tell the history of the Second Empire in France. It tells the story of Nana Coupeau's rise from streetwalker to high class courtesan during the last three years of the French Second Empire. The novel goes on to show how Nana destroys every man who pursues her. 
When Nana's work is done, Zola has her die a horrible death of smallpox. Venus is decomposing. Her moral corruption is now physical. And this, Zola implies, what was what was about to happen to the second empire. It too will die a horrible death. The novel was an immediate success. The first edition of 55,000 copies was sold out in one day. By the 20th century, the nude was no longer sensual or alluring. It rarely told a story or was painted with mathematical proportions. Perfection was no longer the goal. In fact, now abstraction was the focus. Often you didn't know you were even looking at a person, much less a nude. The works that follow illustrate this new emphasis, this new priority. Picture in Fruit Bowl by Picasso is a perfect example. Picasso completely decomposed and reassembled the human body, turning it into a geometric construct. Picasso had complicated relationships with many of the women in his life. He either revered them or he abused them. He had been quoted as saying, for me, there are only two kinds of women, goddesses and doormats. He often became obsessed with the young woman and she became his artistic muse, inspiring many works. He was notorious for his relationship with women, sometimes two to three women at a time, letting, as he said, the women fight it out. He was married twice and had multiple mistresses and it can be argued that his sexuality fueled his art. In this painting, a picture of philodendron plant and a basket of fruit rest on a mantelpiece and are bound together by sweeping black lines. Picasso often invested his still lifes with secret meanings. And this work is a distinguished portrait of his young and voluptuous lover, Marie Therese Walter. You can see her on the right. The picture is painted in, br in brilliant yellow, often used to represent Marie Therese's hair, while the green apple suggests the form of her breast and the curving black lines refer to the contours of her body. Picasso called Marie his muse, lover, and lifeblood. Picasso produced an incredible 20,000 paintings, prints, drawings, sculptures, ceramics, theater sets, and costumes. He amassed a personal fortune and a superb collection of his own art, many of which were paintings of Marie Therese. He died in 1973, leaving an artistic legacy that continues to resonate today throughout the world. Juan Miro, a taciturn introverted man, was a Catalan painter who combined abstract art with surrealist fantasy. In addition to painting, he worked extensively in lithography and produced numerous murals, tapestries, and sculptures for public spaces. In this early work painted in Barcelona, Juan Miró depicts an imposing nude. The figure inhabits an interior with an ornate rug, a spindly plant, and a densely patterned oriental tapestry. The nude is front and center, but is more a part of the pattern background. So it's about style and technique and composition. Miro moved to Paris in 1924 and began to produ produce more abstract and dreamlike paintings. He devoted his career to exploring various means by which to dismantle traditional representation. And you can see that in this painting. The colors he used were bold and expressive and the overall patterns are almost exhausting. Moreau looked at his art as a challenge. His canvas, he said, represented a sandbox for both his conscious and subconscious mind. German expressionists made their mark with nude female figures as well. Many of these works express frustration, anxiety, discontent, violence, and generally a sort of frenetic intensity. These artists were reacting to the ugliness that they discerned in modern life. And you can certainly see that in these paintings. Emil Nolde and Otto Muller were two of the most well-known. Emil Nolde was known for his vibrancy of color and rough hewn mark making. Nolde seized upon color and used it in a bold symbolic way to depict an emotionally charged atmosphere. 
During World War II, the Nazi regime of which Nolde was an, was an outspoken supporter, characterized him as a degenerate artist. He continued to paint throughout the war, mainly using watercolor, so as not to be depicted, detected by the odor of the paint. Otto Mueller used jagged, distorted lines, rough, rapid brushstroke and black outlines. This female nude is angular, lacking details or context. These bony, lean, jagged figures define Mueller's style. His technique was meant to convey the emotional state of the artist, reacting to the anxieties of his world. Again, not the idealized perfection of centuries before. Art was now meant to come forth from within the artist, rather than a depiction of the external world. The character of the artist's feelings, the mindset of the artist creating the work, that was German Expressionism. Known as one of the leading German artists of the 20th century, Max Beckmann is often associated with the German Expressionist movement, but he cannot be pigeonholed. Refusing to join any artistic movement, he was a solitary pioneer of the unique symbolism and style. Throughout his life, he created more than 800 paintings and hundreds of prints and drawings, and SLAM has the largest collection of those works outside of Germany. During the late 1920s, Beckmann was at the pinnacle of his career in Germany. His work was presented by prestigious art dealers. He taught at the famed art school in Frankfurt, and he moved in a circle of influential writers, critics, publishers, and collectors. In the beginning, Beckmann received initial recognition for history paintings and portraits, but the Nazi regime considered modern art to be morally and socially corrupt and labeled it degenerate. So by the end of the 1930s, over 600 of Beckmann's paintings were confiscated. His work was considered primitive, and as soon as Hitler gained power in 33, Beckmann lost his teaching position, and after the degenerate art show, Beckmann fled the country to Amsterdam with his wife. He never returned to his homeland again. In 1945, Beckmann moved with his wife to the United States to teach here at Washington University, and then to New York, where he remained until his death in 1950. By the time of his death, he was, an, he was already an established, he was established as one of the leading painters of the 20th century and his legacy still lives on today. But his physical confinement in Holland liberated his imagination and gave rise to one of the greatest periods of invention. Beckmann responded to the human drama of the war with a surge of intense creativity, producing some of his most visionary works. The subject of the sensual nude woman in this painting, has, it was always a, 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 had a special place in his work. But this, this woman is on display, like a woman behind the windows in Amsterdam's red light district, which was close to the artist's wartime studio where he's known to have wandered at night. Merging his experiences of the past and the present, Beckmann recalls the long standing tradition of associating the female body with timeless ideals of beauty. The stark nature of the model's pose and the distorted form that you see here, however, are more modern updates of this classical ideal. Roy Lichtenstein was an American pop artist inspired by the comic strip. Lichtenstein produced precise compositions that documented while they par parodied, often in a tongue in cheek manner. His work was influenced by popular advertising in the comic book style. Mining materials from advertisement and comics in the everyday Lichtenstein brought what was then a great taboo, commercial art, into the gallery. He stressed the artificiality of his images by painting them as though they'd come from a commercial press with the flat single dot, single color bende dots of the newspaper meticulously rendered by hand using paint and stencils. Lichtenstein would copy the source image by hand, adjusting his composition to suit his narrative or formal aims and then trace the altered sketch onto the canvas aided by a projector. Lichtenstein first introduced the theme of the nude female figure toward the end of his 50 year career. Unlike traditional depictions based on live models, these women are total inventions. They bear little resemblance to nature. 
His nudes are purposely bland, strips of, stripped of corporal attributes. Nonetheless, they reflect the comic book style of imagery he first developed in the 60s. His nudes hold to the two-dimensional geometric shapes and lines that were characteristic of Lichtenstein. However, his style was greeted by accusations of banality, lack of originality, and later even copying. The critics called his nudes cartoon lolitas. But Lichtenstein was laughing all the way to the bank. His most expensive work masterpiece was sold for $165 million in January in 2017. In this painting, Lucian Freud presents a female form reclining on a cot in a barren interior space. Freud's portraits often are called clinical, discomforting, ugly. On one of my tours, a woman briskly walked out of the gallery complaining that these portraits made her uncomfortable and angry. Some have labeled, labeled his work grotesque realism. They're definitely not easy to look at. Born in Berlin, where his father was an architect, Freud came to Britain with his parents in 1933 to escape Nazi Germany. Five years later, as the Nazi news tightened, his grandfather, Sigmund Freud, left Vienna and joined the family in London. Portraits and nudes, faces and bodies were Freud's chief concerns, and they are more or less shocking. Freud's subjects were clearly the person before him, friends, family, lovers, various aristocrats, as well as marginal underworld characters. He shocked almost everybody by painting six portraits of his pubescent daughters and one of his sons in the nude. And a very unroyal, small, six by nine inch painting of Queen Elizabeth. Freud's figures scarcely depict any social or personal space beyond the studio. If anything, his pictures just seem edgy and awkward and uncomfortable. Our last image today is a photograph by Bill Brandt, who has been called the poet of pictures. His career spanned more than 50 years and he's considered one of the most diverse and dramatic photographers of the 20th century. He began his, photo his photography career as a social documentarian, but eventually moved to abstract and surrealist photography late in life. My husband said there is nothing negative about his work. Get it, photography and negatives. Oh, okay. During World War II, Brandt was a staff photographer for the British Home Office documenting the hard times of Londoners suffering through German bombing raids. Brandt produced important groundmaking photographic essays, the most notable being images from the industrial coal mining areas of Northern England. It was only after these stints in photographic journalism that Brandt moved away from social political themes into more artistic work. With the end of the war, Brandt's attention turned away from reporting to landscapes in extraordinary female nudes, such as the one you see here. Placing the camera very close to his subject, the wide angle lens enlarges the foreground to a great degree, making the body parts look highly disproportionate. This wide angle technique, along with the stark black and white tones with little middle range, gives many of Brandt's nudes a highly surreal quality in which the human body warps into bizarre forms. Brandt's work is thus particularly subversive, giving the history of the nude in art, which we have seen, have long seen, is to be about beauty, proportion, and symmetry. I think it's really kind of a interesting juxtaposition. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our first, our first foray into a very popular topic, women in art. Next month, we will continue with a look at how women are depicted in art, as heroines, as religious figures, as working women, and as women of leisure. So again, thanks for joining us. Take care, and we hope to see you next time. Does anyone have any questions or comments that maybe I can answer? Do we have anything? I think everybody's muted, but do we have anything? Any questions or comments?
there's a message in the chat that I say, think says it all for, from all of us, and that is your presentation was terrific. Thank you so much. Oh, that's sweet. Well, I think I think there is. I mean, there are thousands of there seem to be thousands of images um, of women, and I think it's it's kind of fun to walk through the galleries and um, see how they're depicted. It kind of gives you a sen a different sense, I think, than just looking at um, at them in chronological um, context. Are there any questions? I see there's a couple more chat, some things in the chat. Should I, can I get them? Uh, Brant's photos are not, Carol, you ask if Brant's photos are in the gallery. Um, no photograph, very few photographs are in the galleries. Um, they might be periodically um, because they're so light sensitive. So because of that, um, they are basically um, in the prints, drawings, and um, photograph gallery up on the fourth floor. And you can make a, um, you can make a reservation to see those um, anytime that you want. They'll bring them out for you. Um, every so often, they'll put a, a print or a photograph into the um, into the main galleries, but they only stay out maybe for six, three to six months, um, and then they won't be out again for ten years. So, so that was that was a good question. Um, I think that was all the questions. There's a couple of great. Um, Different perspective. Thanks. Um, thanks for that information. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I, I for a hear. moment there, my microphone wasn't working. So, <laughs> all right. So, does anyone else? You can chat. You can unmute yourself if you have a question. Just more wonderful art and more a wonderful program today, Dale. I just. Love the information and all the beautiful, you know, you just do such a beautiful job with your descriptions. I love it. So I hope everyone else enjoyed it too. Does anyone else have any more questions? Well, thank you all for coming in. in um, next month, we'll just be looking at some other images of women in art. Um, and the following two, um, uh, programs would be on women artists. There really are a lot of them. Um, you wouldn't think so, but there are. Um, so even though there's only 5% that are shown um, at, at any given time, I think that percentage is eking up every year. Um, so we'll see a lot of, it's, it's rather interesting. Well, thank so, you again, um, Sharon, Dale. Yeah, oh, and I guess, um, uh, you know, everyone have a good Halloween. <laughs> that, that should be fun. Um, yeah. My Thank favorite you. holiday. This <laughs> is so much fun. Um, although you. we're already wearing masks. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, everyone have a, have a stay safe and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. everybody. Bye-bye.